Yes, it is interesting tonight that we've heard from two adoptees, and we also heard from Rata about his family's experience in Cambodia, because I'm going to speak to you tonight about how I essentially adopted Cambodia. <clears throat> and it started with adopting a child. I adopted, my husband and I adopted our son 11 years ago um, in Cambodia. And um, like most couples who, who start off uh, trying to build a family and find out that they can't have children, this was a very heartbreaking experience for us. Um, but what became of that heartbreak is something much larger um, because it broke my heart wide open and it broke me open to the point where I was able to embrace something much bigger than myself and a whole nother country and a whole nother set of issues. And I'm going to be talking to you tonight a lot about how I walk the walk that a lot of people have been talking about tonight without the benefit of having been able to sit in a room and listen to them talk and tell me how to do it. I just did it. Um, <clears throat> when I went to Cambodia for the first time uh, 11 years ago to adopt my son, <clears throat> I wanted to give back, and I wanted to give back in a way that would um, stop children from becoming orphans like he was. And this is, of course, what schools looked like at that time in Cambodia. Because, as Rata spoke about, the Khmer Rouge regime had destroyed all of the schools and the entire education system, including killing all of the teachers and all of the people who were related to teachers. <clears throat> so I decided to build a school, right? Easy enough, build a school, go home, feel good about yourself, raise your kid, live in Colorado, ski, have a great life. <laughs> and not so much. Um, I ended up, I ended up uh, being deeply changed by my first experience in Cambodia, feeling an incredibly deep connection to this country and this culture who had experienced the trauma of the Khmer Rouge regime, a massive genocide, 25% of the population, and then 30 years of conflict after that that left this was the state of affairs for Cambodian children. Um, I didn't know before I went that Cambodia was the hev most heavily bombed country in US military history. College education never taught me that. And I wanted to know why my son was a war orphan 30 years after that war. So I wrote a book. Uh, there was no other book that would tell me the answer to that question, so I wrote one. Um, <clears throat> In researching for that book, I went back and I saw uh, the school that I had built. Here it is. Um, and I found out it was empty. And I asked the villagers and I asked the children, why aren't you in school? Why, what's going on? Teacher absent often was always the answer to that question. And I didn't want my school to stand empty, so I started to build, I started to support teachers. I built the teachers a house, and then I started sending rice to them. And while I was going back to research my book every time, I found out about the situation for teachers in Cambodia. I asked a lot of questions, and every answer bothered me very much. Um, <clears throat> because every time I went back, there was more and more schools being built uh, by foreigners, like myself, well-intentioned, by the UN, by USAID, by the Japanese government. But guess what? We were just building hope that wasn't real because it was just a building. There wasn't anything happening inside. And the government of Cambodia was supposed to be doing it, but they weren't doing it because, of course, um, there is a power dynamic going on here. There's a corrupt government. Um, <clears throat> and it, the power dynamics of how humanitarian aid works actually keeps people from progressing. This is what I was discovering, and it was bothering me, and it was making me want to change things. At the same time, I also realized I was creating dependency because these people needed me to come back every year to give them the rice and give them all the things they needed to run the school. And I really did, had no idea how to, um, <clears throat> how, how, to, how to make it work without me. And at that time, I was like, oh, OK, um, what am I going to do here? At the same time, I adopted my daughter from India. And suddenly, I had this needy um, two-year-old who had special needs and all kinds of things that I was needing, needing my attention. And I couldn't suddenly give all of myself to the school in Cambodia. And oh my god, what have I done? And how are they going to uh, go on without me? Um, <laughs> I'm not sure I'm in it for life, right? Like I didn't 
decide to do this with my life. It's just in my life now, but I didn't want to, it to stop. Um, and so I started to think about how would I make it sustainable and what does sustainability mean? And at the same time, I published my book and that gave me the ability to raise more money. And so my idea at first was that I would help this community generate income to support their teachers and so that I could finally go home and ski in the mountains of Colorado and have a life. Um, <laughs> But guess what? My first attempt failed. My first attempt was to come in with a new technology to help them create an alternative cooking fuel because they live in a jungle that's being destroyed by a corrupt military that's cutting down all the trees and, and taking all the resources and the water resources and, and um, fueling corruption and all kinds of things that are keeping the community um, from being able to, to work together. Um, <coughs> and that failed. And it failed because um, I didn't realize, I didn't know what I didn't know. I didn't know because I have never grown up in a rural Cambodian village with no electricity and no running water and everybody in my family got killed by the Khmer Rouge regime. How could I possibly solve their problems for them? <clears throat> I had no idea, but I wanted to. I went home from that particular trip crying on the airplane, crying because I knew I could not do it alone. and. I needed help, and I needed more money, and I needed more time, and I needed more expertise, but I needed someone to pay attention to this village. I needed someone to pay attention to the school, and I had a very strong urge um, to let it go. I, I didn't really know what I was going to do. I have to tell you honestly, I hadn't been paid this entire time. I was completely stressed out. I'd gained 25 pounds. I was the un most unhealthy I'd ever been in my life, and my personal finances were in the toilet. And I thought, oh my God, I don't want to let it go. I care deeply about these children. I care deeply about what's happening in Cambodia, yet I can't do it alone. And the first thing I did to turn that around was I started making gratitude statements. I started to saying what I was grateful for in this moment today. What, and, and as I took those steps to make those gratitude statements, um, I learned some things. One is that I had to put myself into the equation. And, and when I put myself into the equation, I started to learn a lot about um, our attitudes about charity and the people doing charitable work. The people doing charitable work have to be in the equation. They have to be supported. When we make donations, those people's salaries matter. If they aren't paid to do it, if they aren't given the resources they need, you're asking them to do the most important work on the planet without any resources and without any support. Okay, we are in partnership with these poverty-stricken poverty people that we're working with. <clears throat> Once I got into that new attitude, our journey to sustainability was really able to begin. I was able to go back to Cambodia with a much more thoughtful approach. Um, I was able to look at the sociological and the psychological issues that were keeping things from progressing. One of the big ones was, of course, as I mentioned earlier, the corrupt government and also the way the UN and the UAID, USAID and the big aid groups work. This woman who is on the screen right now is stirring um, the school breakfast where she gets up at 4 o'clock in the morning and comes to school every day to uh, make rice for 450 children in the morning. She is unpaid. This is the UN World Food Program. They do not give the people the resources they need to actually do it. Who here would show up at 4 o'clock in the morning every day to cook food unpaid, without a light, without a bike? <laughs> you know, all the list of things that these people need to be able to do it are, are kept from them because we think we know, but we're not standing in their shoes. We're not the ones getting up in the dark, riding a bike down a dirt road to a school that has no electricity to try to feed children in the morning. <clears throat> And I also realized that I was up against the villagers' own attitudes that they had learned over time, over these 30 years that they were trying to survive in a, in a very chaotic, you know, war-torn environment. There was tremendous jealousy. There was tremendous selfishness. There was tremendous social, powerful hierarchies in place that were keeping the community in conflict and therefore looking for the foreign aid for the answer instead of looking to each other for the solution? And how could I enable them to look to each other for their solution instead of looking to me? And I have to say that I had the good fortune of meeting um, a person who, you know, asking you shall receive. I received help in the form of Paul Chuck, who's standing in the back of the room. He's 60 years old. He is from Cambodia. 
He spent 25 years as a refugee in the United States and went back to Cambodia to try and help and nobody would hire him. And guess what, he met me, I needed help, I thought there's no way he's gonna be useful, but what the heck, I'll send him out there. And <laughs> turns out that he was tremendously useful because of course he is fluent in both cultures. And he was able to live in this village and to really start to help people uh, in the way they want to be helped, by talking to them, by listening to them. It's because they know how to solve their problems. They just don't know that they know how to solve their problems. We do do a lot of coaching with them and teaching them now to talk with their communities. We work on the core values that we've set sort of a framework to work towards to solve some of these social issues. Participation, communication, honesty, trust, and solidarity. Those five things were lost for 35 years in this country. And we are working with these people to help them understand what it means so that they can then create the human resources and the financial resources that they need in order to sustain their schools and any other development project that comes into their village village. It has to be local kids who are raised up and we actually have also in this room standing behind Paul Chuck our first college graduate. Some Kong is here. <clears throat> And he is now going back to the village as the very first person who has ever been out of the village, who's ever been out of the country, who's ever graduated college. And he represents what you can do if you stay the course and, and value what education can do for you. That's also been lost in this whole process. So who am I in this role now? I have to, somebody, I, I like to say I steer the ship, but everyone else does the work. I had to find out what I, as a first world, educated, blonde haired, blue eyed uh, person with no international development degree could actually be effective in doing. Uh, of course, I had to learn to raise money. I had to learn to ask for money. I had to learn that asking for money is a spiritual experience, OK? That's because money is energy. And I can't do it without energy, and neither can you. So look, don't be afraid to ask for money. Money's energy, money's important. It doesn't happen without money. And if you are a person who doesn't have the time but can give the money, that's OK, because you are just as important. It's just as good to write a check and do it meaningfully and doing it in a way that supports everyone who's doing this work, everyone in the process. And the other thing I can do is I can make them visible, which is what I'm doing right now. This is a marginalized country. I'm working in a marginalized village. They are never in the news. It's not just Cambodia. There's lots of other places. But I can use my um, talents to, to make them visible. So um, the result is uh, now today we have uh, Thankfully, with these two in the back of the room as my, my partners and a lot of people who have supported me um, financially and in other ways, we now have three primary schools, one middle school, and 1,500 kids in our program. We have, <laughs> we have 18 high school scholarship students. We have our first SUI minority male to go to high school, our first set. SUI minority female, this is a minority group, kind of like Native Americans here. Um, we have our first college graduate sitting in the room. And 11 years ago when I started, <coughs> no one had finished fourth grade. <laughs> uh, here they are at one of the primary schools uh, where, of course, we don't have teachers absent often. We have students present often. <laughs> This is a note from one of the kids I want to end on, but I want to share with you what I learned. Uh, what I learned was that the relationship matters as much as the money. It takes a change of attitude on our part to learn how to help people in the way they want to be helped, not in the way we think we should help them. It takes time, a lot of time, a long time. It doesn't happen in a two-year grant cycle. 10 years, it's going to take me to make one school sustainable. And if one can be as sustainable, then another one can be. And another one can be, because we're building the resources that people need to carry that on into their own village. It's going to take money. It takes listening. And it takes a lot of people getting involved. I'm not the, obviously, I can't do it. I can do it with these 1,500, but I can show other people how, and other people can get involved in many, many ways. Because in the final um, <clears throat> thing I'd like to tell you is that Here's the bottom line for everybody who wants to run around this world and build a school. Buildings don't teach children. Teachers do.